Hello and welcome to Unusual Careers, where we explore the variety of careers in science, technology, engineering, arts and math, also called STEAM, at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. My name is Shelly, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'll be your host for today. I am so excited to kick off our celebration of World Migratory Bird Day. Our guest today works to protect migratory shorebirds or birds that frequently visit the seashore or beaches. Some of these birds migrate thousands of miles every year, spanning hemispheres and stopping at beaches, marshes, and grasslands along the way. Before we meet our guests for today, you're gonna to see two polls pop up on your screen. The first, a knowledge check. How far do Arctic terns migrate every year? 3,000 miles, 6,000 miles, 12,000 miles, 22,000 miles. And second, which of the following subjects do you think a quantitative ecologist uses in their career? Science, technology, engineering, art, or math? Select all that apply. While you take some time to answer that poll, I'm going to go over the format of our program today. First, this webinar is live captioned. You'll want to locate that CC button at the bottom of your screen for those to appear. You'll also notice that this program is being interpreted in American Sign Language. This feature is best viewed from a desktop computer instead of a tablet or phone. If you're having trouble with either of these services, please chat us so we can assist you. Remember, this is a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you. However, we encourage you to engage with us in a number of ways. As you already saw, we will be launching polls throughout the program today. Additionally, you will see that the Q&A or question and answer feature is open. Hit that Q&A button at any time to ask questions of our guest. Try to keep your questions on topic and you can always check under the My Questions column to see if your question was already answered. Today's program will be about 45 minutes with an additional 15 minutes at the end to answer as many of those questions as time will allow. Educators, if you are streaming for your whole class, be sure to keep your keyboard close by to chime in on their behalf. You can also use the emoji reactions. Find those emoji reactions and I want you to send me a big thumbs up if you are excited for World Migratory Bird Day. And lastly, you'll see that the chat is also open for you to message us your comments and answers to our questions. Now I want you to find the chat and tell me where you are joining us from. I wanna see who is virtually migrating the farthest. And let's see what our poll says. I'm gonna end this first poll and share our results. The majority of people thought that Arctic terns migrate 6,000 miles every year, but in reality, they are traveling 22,000 miles every year. And you all got it that um, our quantitative ecologist definitely uses science, technology, engineering, art, and math in their career. Let's see where folks are joining us from. Welcome, virtual learning program in Arlington, Virginia. You are all so close. Welcome, Isabel from California. We have Luke from California. We have Millersville, Maryland. Welcome, Tony. Debbie from Virginia. Ruthie from West Springfield, Virginia. Joining from Southern California. Welcome from Philadelphia, Nebraska. We have someone joining us all the way from Germany, Portland, Oregon, Michigan. Fantastic. Let's see if anyone else. More California. Amazing. And we have someone joining from Qatar as well. Someone joining all the way from Madagascar, West Virginia. This is amazing. Now, I also want to quickly introduce our staff helping behind the scenes. Today, we have Erica, Caden, Emily, and Hannah also answering your questions and responding in the chat. And today, we also have a very special chat expert, Mary Dineline, bird conservation and education specialist at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. So you may see some answers from her as well. So once again, Welcome to Unusual Careers. 
I am so excited to welcome our guest, Allie Anderson, to the program. Welcome, Allie. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Nice to see you today. My name is Allie Anderson, and my pronouns are she, her. I am a quantitative ecologist with the Shorebird Science and Conservation Collective at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. Well, wow, that was quite the mouthful. I heard you say that you are a quantitative ecologist. I hear the word quantity in your job title. Viewers, if you know what the word quantity means, put it in the chat. Now, does your job have anything to do with counting? Yes, it does. So I use math, data, computers, and coding to make maps and to figure out where animals go, especially shorebirds, so we can help protect them. That is awesome. And so many people have responded in the chat that it means like the amount of things. So we are looking at the amount of shorebirds. Um, that's amazing. So I briefly mentioned in my intro what a shorebird is, but can you tell us what a shorebird is and why are you studying them specifically? Yeah, so shorebirds are a group of wading birds. They often have long legs and long bills. And they range in size from really small, the size of a sparrow, up to very big, the size of a raven. Oh. And these birds often spend time around wetlands and fields, coasts, and water. And I'm working with the Shorebird Science and Conservation Collective to help save shorebirds because their populations are declining. So many shorebird populations have gone down by as much as nine well, sometimes 90, but often 70% or so. Um, so we're trying to figure out where they go and when so we can figure out the best ways to protect shorebirds. That's great. And so you said a 70% decline in populations. So obviously you are working to try to bring back these populations and save them. Now I wanna see what our audience knows about shorebirds. I'm gonna launch another poll already here. Which of the following are examples of shorebirds? And if you know any other examples, feel free to put them in the chat. Maybe you've seen some shorebirds in areas near you. Oh, we're getting so many answers coming in already. <laughs> um, do you think a killdeer, a long-billed curlew, a red knot, or a lesser yellow leg? And you can see examples of those. Maybe the photos might give away some answers about their habitats. That's amazing. All right, I'll give you another few seconds on that poll. Which of the following are shorebirds? All right, I'll close that in three, two, one. All right, let's share these results. You all kind of got it. Allie, which of the following are shorebirds? All of those are shorebirds. That's amazing. And we had some great guesses. Abby said that the killdeer is their favorite bird. That's great. They are so cute. Oh, someone said egret, ibis, and heron. Absolutely. Um, so we've seen some examples of these shorebirds. And from what you said, these shorebirds migrate. So they spend part of the year in one habitat, and then they migrate and spend part of the year in another habitat. And some and as we saw from our opening poll, those, mi those Arctic terns migrate 22,000 miles a year. So what types of habitats are these birds migrating to and from? Many shorebirds, they breed up in the Arctic, up in the tundra or in subarctic marshes. And then they migrate south during the winter when it's too snowy and cold up there. So in the Western hemisphere, we see many shorebirds will spend the Canadian or US winter down in warmer locations like South America, Central America, the Caribbean, Mexico, and even the Southern US states. Oh, wow. So we have all of these different species. What is the Shorebird Collective studying? The Shorebird Collective is a group of contributors from across the Western Hemisphere. These are biologists, researchers, government organizations, nonprofit groups that are working together to conserve shorebirds. Wow, that is so amazing and very collaborative. We hear this word collaboration across most of our programs because saving species takes the work of so many people. So for the Shorebird Collective to have all of these organizations come together with the purpose of saving shorebirds. 
So what exactly are you doing for the Shorebird Collective? Yeah, right now, my job at this point in time is to aggregate tracking data from shorebirds that has been contributed to the collective. So all of these different groups, many of them have been tracking different types of shorebirds from across the Western Hemisphere, and they have contributed data to the collective as one resource, and I'm working to pull all of that together to support a wide variety of conservation projects for shorebirds. That's so neat. So you talked a lot about data. We know how science really thrives on data. And so you said that this is all tracking data, correct? Of where the birds actually are. Yes, so these data are locations of shorebirds uh, of multiple different species and contributors from all of these different organizations have, have shared their data with the Shorebird Collective. And that's what I'm working to bring together. That's really, really cool. So I, I don't want to go too deep into how the birds are tracked, but Alan, can you give us just a brief example of how some of these shorebirds are tracked? Yeah, so shorebirds are caught by researchers and researchers can put on these tiny tracking devices on the bird. There's a variety of different types that can go on birds. Some examples that you see here are light level geolocators, satellite tags, radio tags, and all of these tags can determine some sort of location of the bird as it moves across the landscape. That's really, really neat, but these are all different types of tags. You said some are measuring light levels, um, others use um, satellites, some use radio telemetry. Um, and for folks watching, if you are more interested in the technology of tracking birds and other animals, look for a link in the chat right now from our Women on the Move series from Earth Day, where we um, really dive deep into how and why animals are uh, tracked. So Ali, we mentioned a few different species of shorebird, um, but how many species is the collective and you tracking and getting data on? Yeah, currently contributors have, have contributed data from over 32 species of shorebirds with tracking devices, which is really impressive. And right now, the, the number of birds, individual birds that we're working with is 2,800 individual tracked birds, which is really cool. So right now I'm working to aggregate those data into one piece, and that amounts to a total right now of 800,000 locations of shorebirds. So it's a lot of data. That is crazy. So we just looked at three different types of tracking tags, but you are getting 800,000 data points that you are responsible for aggregating or combining in the collective. And we are getting tons of shocked emoji faces <laughs> see those. That is a huge amount of data. And again, from all of these different tags that are giving you different types of data. Yes, so this is one of the biggest challenges right now with the work to get to use these data for supporting conservation projects. We need to have them all in one format while taking into account the different constraints of different data types. So some tags collect slightly different amounts of information or at different times. And so I'm working to pull all those data together into one format that, that we can easily access all of that information at once. That's really, really cool. How are you doing that? How are you making one standard kind of data point for all of this? Yeah, so I am using code to pull these data together and to create that consistent format and map the data in a way that we can, can explore it for conservation purposes. Um, you are a coder. That is so, so cool. I already saw from the chat that um, Jeff Kirit does coding too. An audience, if you have ever heard of code or have tried coding yourself, either send me a big thumbs up or put it in the chat. I wanna hear from you. Ali, tell me more about what it's like to be a coder. Oh, Abby is also a coder. So is um, Ali. Adriana was also awesome. interested. That's great. I really enjoy coding. So, um, I write code that, and you can see a picture of it up on your screen here. This is a, a portion of code. And that code tells the computer what 
to do. <laughs> so it takes data that just look like a, a location of a bird, just a latitude and longitude and all these different formats. And then I tell the computer, okay, we, we need the data in this way. We want to make a map like this. And that code can create, combine all that data and create the, the outputs that we need. So the codes can use, can be used to make maps. They, I can apply mathematical models, which are equations to the data that helps filter out any tracking data that might be false detections. And then we can also use math to estimate the, the accurate accuracy of these different locations, because not all of the locations are very exact. Some are more of an estimate. And so we can apply math to those to get a better sense of where the animal is. That is really, really neat. We have so many audience members who have written in that they are coding or that maybe they're coding when they get to middle school or high school. Cool. We have so many coders, but we have a lot of questions coming in too. What language of code do you use? Mm. Yes, so right now I primarily use the R coding language and uh, that's the coding language I first learned. Occasionally I use a little bit of Python code, but I'm not as knowledgeable about that. So I've really focused myself on one coding language because uh, I find I can be more of an expert if I focus in one area. So that's what I primarily use. That's really neat. So again, you're getting this data and then you write this code, which is almost like another language that allows the computer, your program to read all the data um, and as you have said, combine it or aggregate it. That's really, really neat. Um, tell us more about the code and its capabilities. Yeah, so the code, um, it can do a wide variety of things. I use code from all over. <laughs> and so I can, I can take code that others have written for a certain purpose and adjust it. So for example, um, for, for some of the work that I've done today in this figure, you can actually see I use this code, all of these letters and numbers and words and functions to make a map on the right hand side. And that allows me to explore the data when it first comes in. So it doesn't look just like those locations of Latin long and numbers. I can actually see it and see if anything's gone, looks weird and might need to be adjusted. Very cool. Yes, Abraham said so much coding, <laughs> so cool. So you mentioned that you use the codes and the math to help with the accuracy of the bird locations. Can you talk a little bit more about the accuracy and when would you maybe get a data point that is inaccurate or not correct? Yeah, so occasionally there's there's several reasons this could happen. So one, one big reason is that a tracking device might fall off of a bird or a bird might die. And so that device, it, it still keeps working most of the time as long as it can access, you know, if it has a solar panel, if it can access the sun and satellites come over, they will still pick up that tag. And so one thing in the data we might see is suddenly a tag might stop moving, but it will keep detecting, it will keep, the satellites will keep recording the tag. So we don't want that data for looking for conservation purposes because it's no longer on the bird. So one thing I can do with the code is I can I can map out where these birds are. I can look how long the tag has been going, if it's in one location, and then, then I can remove those detections after the tag fell off a bird. And so those are really simple things that you can do in the beginning to with, you know, only a few birds by hand. But once you have a thousand birds or two thousand birds or or even if you only have a hundred birds it would take a very long time to do that by hand and so that's why I have been writing these codes so that we can do that more quickly and in an automated way to try to remove some of these detections and that makes it easier for us so we don't have to do it by hand. That's really really cool and we're getting a lot of questions so you, you mentioned that the birds could possibly die or maybe even get eaten by a predator that would cause some um, data points to still transmit even though they're not accurate. And so we're getting a lot of questions about like how the tags are attached and how easily mm. they can fall off that could potentially cause those inaccurate data points. Yeah, it, it, the short question is it depends on the type of tag. So some tags are 
are, you know, put onto a bird with a harness. And so those are pretty secure and less likely to fall off. So a lot of times if if that if that tag is on correctly and the tag stops moving, you can get a sense that perhaps the bird the bird might have died. Uh, other tags are designed to fall off. So there are some that are radio tags and oftentimes for shorebirds, they're simply glued to the back of the bird and they fall off after a period of time. And so that tag, if it's if the antenna is still up, could still be transmitting to a receiver. Um, so the, the short answer is there's a variety of different ways the tags are attached. And sometimes uh, there's different different scenarios that happen about when these false detections might occur, depending on the type of tag. That's really, really cool. So everything I have learned about coding all came from Mo, the zoo's web developer who joined us for an unusual career. So look for that um, link to our unusual careers um, archive playlist if you want to learn a little bit more about coding for the zoo. But I am so excited to take a look at this program that you coded and built. But again, I want to hear from our audience and I'm going to let us pick our own adventure. Which species <laughs> do you want to track live with Allie? Would you rather see the map of the pectoral sandpiper or the black bellied plover? Let's give you a couple seconds. You can also vote in the chat if you like. Um, let's see what we are getting. It's neck and neck here. <laughs> Both great species, both very cute birds. <laughs> All right, I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, and one. Oh, Ethan said the plover is cute. I agree. All right, I'll share these results. And it looks like <laughs> black bellied plover one. So we are going to screen share and let's take a look at this map that you coded and built. <laughs> Oh, this is so cool. So this just looks like a map. I see some data points on there, but I think it's pretty interactive. And we can zoom in anywhere on any of these points or any of the states or countries. So right now we are looking all the way up in Alaska. So mm -hmm. Allie, talk to us about what we're seeing here. Yeah, so this is an interactive map that I use code to build. And this is one of the first things that I do when data are contributed to us. So I can plot the detections. These are colored by time. So I think the, the first detections are in purple and then they get greener over time. This, this is one bird, detections of one bird. And there, this bird was tracked with a satellite tag. So this satellite tag was put on a bird in breeding in Alaska by Autumn Lynn Harrison at the Smithsonian and her colleagues in Alaska. And what we can actually see is a cluster of detections of a bird with a tag. The purple ones are from one year, green are another and blue are actually another. So this bird, uh, this is where it's breeding up in Alaska. And it actually came back to the same spot three years in a row, which is very cool. And so with a map like this, what I often do is I, I use the code to create a map and then I plot where the birds have gone and I can kind of explore different areas with the points and see if anything looks, looks a little bit fishy. So uh, after the birds breed in Alaska, it heads south. And so actually in the first year, you can see a cluster of purple points at the top. It went a little bit further east along the north um, slope of Canada and then it starts to head south and so you can see these are actually other years there's more than one migration in here um, there's a blue that's another migration and a and green another mi migration uh, but you can see the purple kind of clusters there up in the prairie pothole region which is kind of um, Saskatchewan in Canada and then into uh, Montana and other locations. And so the bird stops there during migration uh, and continues south. And then we can see a bunch of clusters of points and it's kind of neat. We see the different colors again. 
down in Louisiana, I don't know if we have anyone watching from Louisiana, but the bird spends its winter. So when it's snowed all over in the Arctic, it spends its winter down in Louisiana. And again, we see all the points clustered in one location from multiple years. So it's really neat. This bird is breeding in the same spot in the Arctic, moving through the mid-continent, and then it spends the winter in the same spot every year, which is really impressive. Not all shorebirds do that. Often they do, uh, many do go to the same breeding areas and some to the same wintering areas, uh, but it's really neat. We can see where this bird is going. We can also see, if you look to, to kind of the mid-continent and over to the Hudson Bay, that is uh, up in Canada, go further east and north, there's one lone point kind of over, hmm, further east, keep going east. Oh, I think I see. There you go, there's a lone yeah. blue point down right. here. Yeah. yeah. That's something that I would see and say, now that looks unusual. It's kind of out there by its own, it, there's no other points around it. And that's what we, that's what to me, I would say, hmm, that might not be a real location that might be a false location. And that can happen sometimes when a satellite passes over and the, you know, the antenna doesn't have a good reach and so it doesn't get a good signal to send up. And so occasionally you get these points that are not, you know, in the right spot. And so that's something that I would then use code to filter out those detections that are unlikely. That is so, so cool. So just to repeat, this is, we are only looking at a map of data points from one specific black-bellied plover, but across their data points from multiple years, right? Yes, yeah. So is this the same tag was on this bird for these three years, or did you recapture yes. it and put on new batteries or a new tag? No, so this was on the same bird and it, it actually recorded it for four years. It was fit with a harness and it wore it like a little uh, backpack. And then the tag is charged by a solar panel and that's how it can last that long. Other types of tags don't necessarily do that. Some, some are only designed to last for a couple of months, uh, but some can last for many years, which is really neat to see what the bird does in more than one year, maybe under different weather conditions, or if it's dry, does it go someplace else? Those are so sorts of questions that we can get a sense of. We can also get a sense of what key habitats the birds are using. So um, it's possible even to zoom in on some points and then you could, you could look at the imagery there. Is it a town? Is it a field? Is it... Um, is it a wetland, that sort of thing? Those are things you can do with tracking data. That's so, so cool. And just to repeat, we had a question, the different color dots, those are the different years, right? That was Yes. Saw. Yeah. Awesome. Emily had asked that question. This is so cool. And so I actually have a treat and I want to look at another map, if possible, um, where we will actually compare two different species. And so audience members, I want you to kind of put on your avian scientist hat, your quantitative <laughs> ecologist hat, and start making some observations about what you're seeing here. Are there any similarities or differences between the two species? And here we are actually looking at the black-bellied plover and the pectoral sandpiper. So I don't know if you can see. So the dark dots are gonna be the black-bellied plover. And if you see any yellow dots, that is going to be the pectoral sandpiper. Let's see, do folks notice any differences in their migration? I know the yellow ones might be a little hard <laughs> to see on your screen, <laughs> but it looks like, oh, here's a continent that we didn't visit before with the black-bellied plover. So talk to me, Allie, a little bit about, oh, uh, yes, we're getting some observations here. Um, mm -hmm. Isabel and Japkeep said that there are less yellow dots than the black bellied plover dots. That's a really good observation. And the reason that is, is because these are two different types of tags. So these are 
these are really great observations. These are things that I think about when I'm looking at the data as well. So the, the black-bellied plover, the purple dots, there's two reasons why there's more points. One, the bird was tracked for four years, so there's just more points in general. The pectoral sandpiper was only tracked for one year. And so you see more purple for the black bellied because more years of tracking, but also there are two different types of tags. So the black bellied plover, the purple points, that's a satellite tag. And satellite tags tend to take more locations. We get more locations off of those birds, but the locations are not as accurate. Sometimes they're off by, you know, 10 kilometers. So you kind of know, okay, the bird is in this general area, but you don't know exactly where it is. So there's more locations and we can use math to, to estimate what is the most likely location. The pectoral sandpiper was act actually tracked with a GPS tag and a GPS tag can take very accurate locations. So you can know almost exactly where the bird is at a given time. And so we obtain very, uh, we obtain less locations, but they're very accurate. So those are all things that I have to consider when we receive different types of data are, why are there mo more locations? How can we standardize the data so that they're in a similar type and we can, and com we can compare them. That's so cool. And so we had actually both Claudia and Flynn noticed that the sandpiper does go a little bit farther south and maybe the sandpiper likes warmer climates. So we are seeing pretty different migrations of these two shorebird species. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. They they both receive their tags up in the Arctic where they breed in, in kind of a similar area, but they do go to very different locations. And so this, this can be true of multiple different shorebird species. The pectoral sandpiper migrates a really uh, much longer way than the black-bellied plover. The pectoral sandpiper, we would consider it an a long, extreme long distance migrant. You know, it goes all the way down to Argentina, uh, whereas the, the black-bellied plover, sometimes some black-bellied plovers will go into South America for sure. Others will just stay in the Southern US states. So it still migrates a very far away, but not as far as um, pectoral sandpiper. And so when we bring these data together from 30 different species of shorebirds, we can start to figure out, okay, where, where are multiple species overlapping? Where do we see the most shorebirds? What areas might be the most important to a variety of species? or to just single species. And that can help us determine where certain conservation actions might be um, most beneficial to the, the most species or to particular individual species, depending on their specific needs. That is really, really cool. And we had so many great observations in the chat. And now I want you to continue putting your observations in. Tell me if you see any of those tracking points in a state that you live or maybe a state that you've been to or a country that you've traveled to. I wanna see if anyone overlaps with either the pectoral sandpiper or the black-bellied plover. Um, so let me know in the chat. Ali, this has been so cool to see this process from what code looks like we saw what all of that raw data looks like and how you now combine it and have created this interactive map. This is so, so cool. Can you tell us a little bit about how you learned how to code? Yeah, so I didn't learn to code until I was an adult. So you can always learn to code. And uh, I learned when I started my graduate research. I started my research as a wildlife biologist at, during my master's degree, and I had one class that got me started coding. And then since then, I've continued to do a lot of self-learning and teaching, following online examples, so that I can learn to do each individual thing that I, that I need for these different wildlife research questions. That's really, really neat. And it sounds like a lot of our viewers are already taking coding classes or maybe are looking forward to taking coding classes later in their school year. Do you have any advice for um, folks watching that might be interested in learning more or getting involved in coding? Yeah, so with code, I think the key is to start simple. So start with this uh, topic you're interested in and start with a really simple objective. So for me, when I get started with coding, it's 
how can I bring in the data, look at it and create a very simple map? That's one thing that I can do. And then slowly over time, you can start, you have more skills, you have more coding skills, so you can start to learn different, uh, more advanced sort of coding. So when you look at this slide up here, this is actually an example of how you can go from a very simple map to something more advanced. So this is that same black belly plover and you see the map. And what I've done here is applied math equations to the data to estimate the most likely location the bird is during the day or during at each day and to remove some of these false locations. So the points are that the colored points are the estimated locations each day. And then those black points were the original points where the satellite told us the bird was. So you can see up in the Hudson Bay area, remember that one blue point that was kind of floating out on its own? It's a little black triangle now. We've ruled that one out. We've said, okay, that's, that's unlikely to be true. And we've estimated the locations of the other birds. And so you, you can start small, just plotting the birds or, you know, depending on what your code is, maybe you're programming a robot or something, but you can start with a very simple step and then you start building it up and, and can do more and more complex tasks. That's so cool. And we had a, a question and comment from um, Sophia and Adam in the chat about how complicated code can be. So it kind of feels like you can build on top of that. Um, yes. And Dayon also in the chat said that there's some websites that you can actually practice coding for anyone interested. So that's really, really neat. Cool. Um, again, this has just been so cool to see how you've built this. But if we can back up a little bit, you've mentioned some of the things that this program that you built can tell us. Um, so why are all of these scientists and organizations sharing all of this data to the Shorebird Collective? Yeah, so because the shorebird populations are declining and most of the tracking data is kind of held by different owners and they maybe only have a few bird tracks here or tracks of one species, they're all coming together to, to aggregate that data into one resource with the hope of being able to, to identify conservation actions that can help the most shorebirds. So, um, so all of these groups are coming together and bringing the data into one resource so that it can be accessed instead of having to go to, you know, 15 different contributors yeah. and get those data, it can all be ready to go when a conservation question that's really urgent about shorebirds comes up. That's so cool. So again, all of this combined data can help us answer key questions for conservation or to save these birds. So I want you all to think that what are some of these questions that scientists and researchers might have about migrating birds? Um, what questions do you have about migrating birds? I'm gonna launch another poll here. What questions might scientists have? And if you have other questions, put them in the chat. Why do birds migrate? Where do they go? When do they migrate? What habitats do they prefer? And what habitats need to be protected? And again, if you think of any other questions that a scientist or researcher might have about saving birds and migrating birds, put it in the chat too. I did see a comment about asking for more time for the polls. So I'll leave this one up for a little bit um, while you answer and um, put your answers in the chat. This is so neat. That is a lot of birds in this picture we are looking at too. <laughs> what species are we looking at here, Allie? This is a mixture of species. I think this is mostly white rump sandpiper and semi-pollinated sandpiper. Shorebirds are really interesting because a lot of them, they breed, you know, up in the Arctic all spread out. And then during their migrations, a lot of times they aggregate in these very large groups. Um, so sometimes it's actually, you can see a large group like that and think, oh, shorebirds are doing great. Look at how many they are. But the reality is they all congregated in one spot just during migration. When they spread out, there's, there's not necessarily as many as you might um, think when you see a large group like this. Yeah, that's great. All right, I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, and one. And you all really got it. I'll share the results here. But all of these questions are really important. And we even had some more questions in the chat too. Felicia said, what eats birds? What are their prey? Um, Ellie said, how many birds migrate and how often do they stop? 
Kaylee said, why are migratory birds important? Ellie said, how far they can fly? What do they eat? Absolutely. That all really important questions that we need answers to so that we can better save these birds. Um, is that not right, Allie? Yes, that is. So all of these are really important questions. And to protect shorebirds, we really have to know where are they going? When are they in those spots? Because sometimes they're, you know, only in a spot for two weeks, but it could be very important to the bird. Uh, what times of year? Are they using certain habitats? And then when we know where they're going, when they're going, what habitats they're using and what resources are important to them, then we can help identify actions that might be helpful. So in some cases, there are, there are programs where uh, farmers can leave their fields flooded for the two week period when shorebirds might migrate through so they can use that habitat. Or sometimes beaches are closed down for two weeks so that a bird can forage there without being disturbed while it's migrating. Those are all certain things that the data can help determine what areas are important and, and when, so we can figure out what actions mo might most help shorebirds. That's so great and so important. Now, um, another question about all of this data that you're getting, is this available to the general public? Can anyone watching access this data and see where birds are? In some cases, yes. So some of the data contributors have made their data what's called open access, which means that it's public and anyone can see the data. And a lot of that data is available on a, a repository called MoveBank. And you can explore all types of tracking data, not just shorebirds. But in other cases, some of the data needs to be kept private or, or secret. That is really, really neat. So I think um, Hannah dropped that MoveBank uh, link in the chat so you can look at all of those different species. But you just mentioned that sometimes you have to keep the data secret, top secret bird tracking <laughs> data. Now I want you to, again, put it in the chat. Why do you think, audience, why do you think that we have to keep some data secret? Let's see what folks think. Any ideas? Oh, Emily and Rachel got it on the first <laughs> guess. Yes, Claudia, absolutely. Yes, Isabel. Allie, why do we have to protect some of our bird tracking data? Yeah, so some of the species are species at risk or maybe they're endangered or threatened. And so we want to keep the bir birds safe. We want them to not be disturbed. And so those birds, it's important to keep that information private. There's also some, some laws for some states protect birds and say, oh, you, you can't show the exactly where this bird is. You need to give kind of a buffer around where it is, again, to protect the bird. Uh, and sometimes different researchers are working on individual studies. And so they are waiting until they can finish their study before that information is shared with the public. So there's a variety of different reasons. That's so neat. And yes, you are all getting it in the chat to keep them safe. If they're really endangered, like she said, that we don't want to necessarily share that information until we know that their populations are in a good spot. Yeah, maybe we have to protect their environment if they're endangered. All great guesses. Um, that is just so cool. Ali, how did you get into this field? Yeah, uh, in some ways it was a little bit of an accident. I was I started to become a wildlife biologist, so I loved animals. I like doing research and I, I did that work uh, through my, my graduate school degrees, studying animals and what they were doing. And I realized as I was doing that, that you need to have a good understanding of math, statistics, things like coding a lot of times to be able to, um, to interpret the data that is coming in from your research questions. And so I found I really like statistics, math and coding and started to really build my skills in that area. And so that's kind of how I got into this more mathematical side of wildlife biology. And I think this, this quantitative ecology field has been along a really a long time. Um, but it's really growing in recent years with new technology advances. 
That's so cool. So you mentioned it is a growing field. So for those folks watching that might be interested, why is it growing so much um, that we're collecting so much more data now than we were in the past? Yeah, for birds and tracking data, one of the, ma the main reasons is that the, the tracking devices have they keep getting better over time. So historically birds, they're, they're very small animals. You have to be careful how big of a tracker you put on a bird because you don't want it to weigh the bird down. So they need to be really light. And prior to small, the development of these really small tracking devices, tracking devices were too big to put on birds. And so most of the data coming from birds and understanding their movements was by banding them, putting a little uh, metal band on their leg, letting it go, and then seeing when that bird would be captured again, or if it died, if someone found the little bird with the band on its leg, then you would know, have a rough idea of where it went. But more recently, these trackers have gotten small enough that they're not very heavy and they can be applied to birds. And so we start to get all of these data from the satellites. And now we even can track birds at a finer scale with GPS units. And so as the technology gets better and better, we get more tags that can that can record more locations of birds. And that means more and more data coming in that needs to be analyzed and cleaned and filtered and put in a consistent format so that we can use the data for these conservation questions. That's so great. It's so great to hear that as our technology advances, it allows us to do more and more for these endangered species. So now that you're in this field, what is something that you wish you knew when you were younger? Yeah, I didn't know that math could be applied to animals. When I was in school, most of our math questions or types of, of you know, examples in math class, they were often about things I wasn't as interested in, things like you know, speed of a car or gravity or finances, uh, counting money, those sorts of things. And I rarely had an example about animals, which I really like. And so I liked math, but I didn't always, I didn't find it that interesting because I really liked animals. Um, and I wish I had known that you could apply math to help animals that I think that would have been really interesting to me and would have maybe got me looking at this area when I was younger. That is so neat. Math is so important to saving species. I want you to give me a big thumbs up if in your opinion, animals would make math mm -hmm. more exciting. Kimberly said in the chat that a student said math is the language of the universe. That's great. <laughs> oh, we are getting wow. so many thumbs up. And Taylor said they love birds. Yes, yeah, so many thumbs up. Can you give us an example of this bird math that you do? Yeah, so the math can range from a variety of different things. Sometimes it can be, you know, applying equations to estimate locations of birds or numbers of birds. But it can be even more simple things. For example, uh, we can see where the bird was tracked. And here's one example that I was looking at recently, a Hudsonian godwit that researchers with Environment Canada had, Canada had tracked from the Arctic. It flew and migrated across the Atlantic Ocean. It left land around the coast of Maine. So I don't know if anyone's up in Maine, uh, but it left land around there and it flew nonstop for 3000 miles until it reached Venezuela. And so the tracker can, we can record, we can use math to estimate how long a distance that was, which was about 3000 miles. And then we can see with the tracking device that it traveled about 600 miles per day. So one thing we can say is, okay, well, if it, if it went that far and that was about the rate that it was moving per day, how many days did it actually take the Godwit to reach Venezuela in its flight nonstop? And so we can do 3000, divide that by 600 miles per day. How many days did it spend flying straight? And I don't know if people can do math that quickly, yeah. but that, yeah, do we have questions going in? We got, I think we got the answer on our screen. All right. So, okay. Yes, awesome. Oh, Isabel got it. Absolutely. Yeah. Five days. So this bird flew for five days straight, 
which is really cool. So there's a wide variety of ways math can be applied to birds. And that's just one simple example. That is just so, so cool, Allie. My last question before we move on to the Q&A, because we are getting so many questions in the Q&A <laughs> and keep them coming, is again, we mentioned that this, we are kicking off our celebration of World Migratory Bird Day. And I wanna hear from you, Allie. And I will also wanna hear from our audience members. Again, put it in the chat. How are you celebrating World Migratory Bird Day? Allie, if you want to answer too. Oh, for oh, me, I thought I was waiting yeah, yeah. for students. Oh, uh, how will I cool. celebrate World World Migratory Bird Day? So I plan to go out bird watching, and I will report my observations through eBird, which is a way that anyone around the world can help monitor birds and record where they see them, when and where. And so I'll put those observations in, and later scientists might use that data to help birds. That's amazing. Um, Ellen said that they're going to avoid pesticides. Oh, and Claudia asked, what is bird-friendly coffee? Can you quickly tell us what bird-friendly coffee is? Yeah, so coffee is a plant actually. So it's a bean that comes from a plant that grows in a variety of locations, often in tropical areas. And there's, there's different ways to grow coffee. So some coffee is grown um, in ways that support birds by, I think, keeping the canopy more intact and allowing more natural uh, environment. And other coffee is grown less friendly to birds. So I don't think the canopy is kept intact. There's less, uh, yeah. there's less natural environment for the, co the coffee plants to grow. And so it doesn't support as many birds. So the bird-friendly coffee can help birds and still allow you to drink coffee, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. So bird-friendly coffee is coffee that's grown in shade. So they keep those um, forest canopies, which helps promote all of the biodiversity in the natural forest and the shade environment, rather than having to clear cut forest. That was so important. Um, so that is so great. Let's see what some other people said that they're gonna do. Taylor loves <laughs> doing eBird. Um, amazing. <laughs> Anna shared some links for eBird in the chat. Um, Lily's going to keep their cats indoors. And Isabella said, avoid using plastic, single use plastic. That is fantastic. Well, I am going to launch our closing poll because we have reached our 10 minute mark. And I know some folks might need to migrate off elsewhere. So I just want to hear from you before we move to the Q&A, but do stick around. We have lots of questions to answer. We just want to know how you felt about today's program and how it left you feeling. All right, let's see. Um, from the Q&A is how would a young person who shows interest get more involved in your field? Are there any websites that they should check out to learn more? Uh, that's a good question. There's a wide variety of ways to get involved. So um, some there's in my kind of field, there's two two areas that are coming together. It's birds and then there's the more math type questions. So a great way to get started with birds, honestly, is just to go out watching birds. There's a variety of resources through Cornell Birds you know, look at birds you see outside your school or outside of your house and try starting to identify them. So that's one really great way uh, to start learning about birds. Cornell has a lot of resources for that. Uh, there's even bird apps that can help you identify birds. I think Merlin is one of those. Uh, Audubon also has some other apps too. Um, and then there's the more math and coding side. And so there's a ton of different options for coding. Um, you know, like I said earlier, you can code things to program robots, or you can start learning how to map things uh, with code. And, and there's a variety of different coding language. So I would recommend uh, to pick an area of interest and, and look up the different options for coding there because you want to be interested in the thing that you're that you're trying to code. Absolutely. That's the key. Yeah, this is such a great intersection of that technology and that um, in the field researcher as research aspect. That is great. Um, Taylor and Matthew want to know what your favorite bird is. My favorite bird is also a shorebird. It's a white rump sandpiper. 
And I really like the white rump sandpiper because it's a small shorebird. It's not much smaller than a sparrow, but it migrates an incredibly long distance for the size of the bird. So it breeds up in the high Arctic and it will migrate all the way down into Argentina, which wow. is the southern part of South America. So this tiny bird can achieve this. It's very cool. That is really neat. Um, we saw a lot of where that tracking data goes and Bruce wanted to know if the trackers and the tags will still work in the water, knowing that these are shore birds that probably get wet. Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, the tags are designed to handle the elements. So they can, you know, they can receive some sort of water or handle an amount of water. There are types of tags that actually can record. This is a cool thing about some of the advances in tracking technologies, but there are tags that can actually sense when the tag is submerged in water. And so they can record that. And then for certain shorebirds, you can get an estimate of when was the bird on water or in the water or on land and when was the bird flying, which is really cool because that's another constraint of the tracking data. You receive these locations of where the bird is, but you don't necessarily know what it's doing. And so if the tag can record environmental uh, variables like oh. the amount of water, you can get a sense of what the bird is actually doing when that location is recorded even like another additional layer. Yes. So cool. So Miss Kimberly asked, how do scientists use writing and reading in their work besides just data collection? Yes, so scientists do a lot of writing and reading. Scientists incorporate a wide variety <laughs> of different topics into their research. And so reading, one main way we use reading is by reading other studies or work of what other researchers have done to try and guide what we're doing or to learn more about, for example, if we were tracking a white rimmed sandpiper, where it might be going um, and writing. A lot of times we have to write our results. We might have to pull together a report or an infographic. Um, or even a scientific paper, a wide variety of different types of writing. It can be short, it can be long. So we, we do all of those things, which was something I was really surprised about. Um, when I became a researcher was the wide variety of fields that we incorporate into what we do. Yeah, that's great. And again, the importance of sharing knowledge. You know, we are learning so much from this data and from this science and research. So by writing about it, we're disseminating, sharing everything we know so other people can also do the work to help save these species. Yes. That's amazing. Um, Michaela asked, you said some of these birds are so endangered that we don't share the data. Michaela wanted to know, what is it like? What's the feeling like to find birds that some people have never seen and may never seen? That's a great question. Um, it's really exciting. And it feels like a large responsibility, right? So if um, when I did my PhD research, we tracked some endangered birds. A red knot is one that's endangered in Canada. And it's very exciting to see that bird that not everyone will get an opportunity to see, but it's also a large responsibility because the bird is endangered. And so you have to be very careful with the birds. Um, you really want to get as much information as you can from the bird so that you can you can use it in its depending on what your objectives are to help the bird as best as possible. Uh, but it feels like a lot of responsibility uh, when you when you have an endangered bird that you're working with. Okay. It's also very exciting and in, and inspiring when you let that bird go. You think, oh gosh, are we going to see this bird again? Who might see it next? It's really exciting. That's so great. Um, we have time for one more question, but I know we have tons in here, so I'm sorry we didn't get to them all. <laughs> um, but the last question I have for you is what are some of these, the impacts of habitat changes along the migration paths that you're seeing? Yeah, so um, Again, it really depends on the individual, the species and where it's going um, and the type of habitat it uses. So one, 
one concern with shorebirds a lot of times is development along the coast um, because many of them do use coastal you know intertidal areas where the tide comes in and out um, and so sometimes habitat is converted for different purposes and that might might affect shorebirds. So that's one. Um, other types of habitat change can be not necessarily uh, human change to habitat, but it can be, you know, water levels is a big one where the habitat changes depending on how much rain is there. And that might affect whether the shorebird stays for a short period of time or decides to move on. Um, so it really depends on where it on the species, where it's going and, and when, all those three questions we try to answer with tracking data. Again, just why habitat conservation is just so important for species across the globe, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, all of the above. Um, Allie, this has been fantastic. <laughs> I have personally learned so much. Thank you for joining us on Unusual Careers. Do you have any final words of advice for our viewers? Thank, first of all, thanks for having me. And second, my advice is if you are interested in, in birds and in math and applying that to wildlife, just get started small with something that you, you are interested in and give. And part of science is also you try something, it doesn't work, and you, you try something again and you learn as you go. So that would be my advice. Maybe notice some birds or start paying attention to birds you know, as you go out for a walk or around your house. And uh, if you're interested in coding, give it a go with something small and see what you can do. That is amazing. Thank you so much again, Allie. And thank you to everybody for joining us today. I know that we didn't get to all of your questions. For all of you that had questions specifically about tagging birds and bird banding, I hope you can join us. Um, next Wednesday, May 11th at 1 p.m. Eastern, where we will um, be joining Exploring Black Backyard Birds, um, where we will meet with some researchers and scientists who are tagging these birds, and we will learn all about bird banding. So I hope you will join us then. Additionally, our last unusual careers of the season will be Friday, June 3rd. We would love your feedback on today's program. When you close this webinar, you will see a survey pop up. Educators, if you can take a few minutes to fill that out. And to catch up on all previous Unusual Career episodes, please check out our YouTube playlist. On behalf of the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, we hope you have a wild day. <laughs>